Hi, I'm Mike Maloney, and welcome to another CSRM podcast. Today's episode is hosted by Dr. Greg Linville. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome back to another CSRM podcast. And we are continuing on with our conversation of one of the ologies of sports outreach as we are dissecting the uh, book, Putting the Church Back in the Game. I'm joined once again by Scott Stedman our Director of Digital Resources, and also Dr. Greg Linville, who is the author of this book, and uh, our Director of Resources as well. And um, Greg, as we think about this next topic in Chapter 9, we're going to talk about the why, the where, the when, and the who that gathers. And when I think about um, our current context in this world and, and right here in our own country, uh, we are um, we're coming back to church. You know, we're coming out of COVID. Uh, a lot of sports uh, ministries are going back on again. A lot of things are back in person. There's even some hybrid things going on. Um, but I think this is a really important and relevant topic. Uh, so kind of give us an overview of, of what you were thinking about here and, and why gathering and why we gather and who we gather with and where we gather and what that should look like why that's a, a really important topic for us to consider when it comes to sports outreach. Well, first of all, thank you. And it's good to be with you guys again. And it's been fun to walk through this book together and these concepts because foundationally, if we don't know what we believe about the church, and that is the universal capital C church and how local congregations of that fit in, it's a little difficult for us to know what we're supposed to do and who we're supposed to be with. So we're not going to reiterate all the stuff that we've talked about in prior podcasts, but the, the concept there is that the church is designed for purpose and for reaching out. And so we come today about why does any of this matter? And we this is, this is kind of the, the fourth and final subtopic uh, that we've talked about. We've talked about funding. We've talked at, at, at how do we uh, deal with some of the leadership. We're going to talk more about leadership today. But why does this matter? Why does it matter what we think about the church and where it gathers? Well, it if we don't know and it's hard for us to know how to program it program anything and so just jumping into this a little bit why it matters um let's just be honest there's billions of people in the world who today don't know jesus and we know that the best way to go and make disciples is through the church um, yes, CSRM is a para ministry. We're a ministry that's in the church, but beside local churches, it's not not a local church. And yet, the purpose of our of our whole mission is to either help people plant a new church. Dan, that's what you're doing. Uh, you're you're planting a church, or come along churches that have maybe fallen on hard times, or they're not going as well. Uh, they, they need strength, they need encouragement, they need tools, they need equipment, they need all of the above, or the church that seems to be blowing and going, and how can we help them expand their influence? And so, all of that to say that we're helping churches around the world, or planting churches around the world, so they can go reach that person who's far from Jesus. I mean, that's simply put why this matters. And if anybody cares about that, there are these billions of people. In fact, there are millions every day that pass into eternity. And if we care about where they spend eternity, then that's why this matters. That's why ecclesiology matters. 
And so we're helping then the local congregations of the worldwide church figure out a methodology that is strategic, relevant, efficient, and effective. And what we feel is that it's the most strategic and relevant, efficient, and effective tool and methodology out there. And so that's why it matters. Um, why I think we need to add a, ask a second question here, and that is, why does the church gather at all? And we can find scriptures that say that it exists so that we can equip the saints for disciple making. And that's based of, obviously on Ephesians chapter four. And so when we gather, this is part of what we believe about the church or we should believe, because I think there's a lot of people who may not believe this, and that is that we gather not for ourselves, but for others. We gather ourselves to come together to be equipped, according to Ephesians 4, so that we can go into the world and reach those people who today are far from Jesus. Now, when I say that's the way most people don't think about it, it's because most people think, I need to go to church for one of these reasons. It's my duty as a Christian, or I need to go so I can leave some money, or maybe I go to serve somebody in the church. I'm going to teach a class or do something else. I'm going to drive the bus to get people there, or that I'm going because I need it. And it's not that those are invalid reasons, but the ultimate for all of that is so that we can be equipped to make a difference in our world. So we gather for these purposes to corporately praise God, but also then to equip the saints for ministry. So I kind of short-circuited that first one to come and praise God because it's so often the second one is not even considered. But I think people are tracking and getting the point. So. We then, within the sports ministry, sports outreach community, when, when we're dealing with this, we're applying this principle to all that we're thinking about and doing because we really know that we've got to equip people to go reach people and that doing it with sports rec and fitness methodologies is what really works. So. I'm going to end with this, and, and Dan, you can keep us moving in a, in a direction, but that we do this by informing people. In other words, we're giving them information that they can think about, and we then are instructing them. And I really think we need to think about this, that we need to retrain people because we've been trained that you come to church to worship yeah. at best. And what we're saying, no, you need to come with a purpose in mind that you are to be trained and inspired and motivated to go back out. And then that comes to that third one, the, the inspiring, that yes, we want to inspire you, give you reason and, and, and motivation to go reach those who are far from Jesus. So that's kind of a summary, Dan, where do you want to take it? Well, I think you said a couple of really good things that we need to consider when it comes to uh, sports rec and fitness and then church, um, you know, Sunday morning gathering as well. Um, we tend to sometimes forget about equipping. Um, it is something where we live in a culture where um, we're so used to inspiring. And I think we, we get that. But what that does is it just creates uh, passive Christians, passive uh, worship services, passive sports rec and fitness ministries or sports rec and fitness ministries and programs, camps, whatever, that honestly don't matter because um, maybe we're teaching them something with, you know, a sports skill, but we're not equipping them to follow Christ. We're not equipping them to know, hey, if, if you're a Christian, God has given you everything that you need through the power of his word and the Holy Spirit uh, to reach others and to invite others to be a part of this. So I think your breakdown uh, was was really good there. 
And uh, we, need to, we need to remember that when we do gather, it is to worship and praise God, but it is also uh, to instruct, to equip, to inspire, to send people out so that they can live the other six days of the week or the next time they come to our program or camp or league. Um, and, you know, when they're out there in, in their jobs, when they're out there in their schools, that they're actually living as a true disciple of Jesus and reaching others as well. That's when the church works best. So I think you broke it down there very, very well. Greg, tell us, we talked a little bit about why. Um, I think a big question, especially when it comes to relating uh, sports rec and fitness, is, is where should we gather? Do we have to go to a sanctuary with stained glass and pews? That might be part of it, but but where should we gather for worship? It's a great question. And again, this is something where we want to specifically think about it through the eyes of the sports rec and fitness uh, minister of the church or the, that ministry within a local congregation. And there are wonderful reasons why people have created these sacred spots, if you will. It's called a sanctuary, and it's the sanctum. It's this, the thing that is something that is deeply spiritual. I'm rather, I'm rather uh, of, a, of a mindset of the old Celtic evangelists, and they had a concept that was called the thin spots, the thin places. And the thin place for them was where the veil between heaven and earth seems to be thinner and that we can have access to God. There's a lot of people that would get that immediately when they say, yeah, when I'm hiking that mountain peak or I'm sitting beside uh, the Great Lakes or the ocean or someplace that I, I just feel something there, that the spirit is really there. And, and yes, the, the, so in, in that sense, there can be a sanctuary anywhere. Some of them that are made by human hands help us, but sometimes it's just God who has created that, and, and those are sanctuaries as well. And so uh, there's no place in the, in the scripture that says you have to go to a place. There is uh, a mandate that we need to gather together. Hebrews and other places say things like, do not forsake gathering together. So we're supposed to gather, where we're supposed to gather is, is kind of open. And at the, at the risk of offending some folk, it doesn't have to be in that sanctuary. Now, I think that we should not move away from the sanctuary too quickly because many, many sanctuaries, particularly classical ones, the architects have, have thought through what it, what it is and, and why it is that when you walk in, that you want to fall to your knees and look upwards to God. It, that's what a good sanctuary will do architecturally. In the same way, that a gymnasium makes you want to get on the shoes and get out on the court and play. Uh, a good architect is going to help you do that by what they do with their building. So we shouldn't minimize that, but it shouldn't ever dominate us to say that we couldn't do worship outside of the sanctuary. In fact, one of the things that we often consult with, within CSRM with churches is that we say, why is it that the words or the signage that says worship center is only on one building, never on what would be called the gymnasium? Because in our way of thinking ecclesiastically, they're both worship centers. And in one, you use a guitar and an a organ and music. And in another one, you use a ball. And regardless of how we praise God, we worship God, we do that through our athletics and through our music and through the dramatic arts. And I've been moved to tears many times by drama. And, and it, 
and also by music, but also in the gym of seeing somebody who has overcome obstacles, whether they, they be disability type of obstacles or the obstacles of, of taking on a foe that was just far superior. You know, I think we can grant can gain inspiration in any of those formats. And so we really say, the scripture says, wherever two or more gather together, that's where the Holy Spirit is in the midst of them. And so the sanctuary can be just anywhere where we're out and about. So what do you think, Dan? Is that a... <laughs> yeah, that I, I think that makes a, a whole lot of sense. Um, you know, in, in the Western world, um, a lot of times we have these church buildings that have a multi-purpose room where um, Sunday morning, you know, it is the more typical worship with singing and you have instruments and somebody preaching, maybe some communion or something else like that, um, celebrating some of the sacraments. And then as soon as uh, service is over, um, you know, the rest of the week, that building becomes a gym uh, for sports leagues. But I love how you're challenging us to kind of blur those lines because we're two or more gathered. Um, if Jesus is the focus, it, it can be worship. And when we honor God with um, anything that he's given us uh, within our body, our physical talents, um, you know, as we get older, maybe those physical talents aren't what they used to, but we can still honor God when we dribble a basketball, when, when we play hard, when we uh, live out Christmanship and, and, and we play like we believe Christ would play. Um, I think that's a that's a unique way to look at uh, what worship can look at and look like and where we can worship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's there's also uh, some other things here that we often think about this from a Western mindset or a North American mindset or a European mindset, and we have these facilities that have been, I mean, they've just been out there for some of them thousands of years. I mean, when you go to the Isle of Iona in Scotland, I mean, that thing is like 1500 years old and somebody has been in, in the same exact sanctuary in that cathedral. They've been worshiping God for millennia. And, and personally having been able to, to be there and share in those prayers, it, there's something very special about it. But there are many places in the world that have no buildings and all they have is a field. All they have is a tree that provides some shade and that can become their sanctuary, their thin place. And so we know a lot of our folks, a lot of our global network partners and staff led by uh, PF Myers, we, these folks, they'll roll the soccer ball out, the, the football, what they call the football, and they'll put it out there on the pitch we would call a field and they play and then they sit and they worship. After they worship with the ball, they sit and worship traditionally hmm. and it's all the same place. And so we just have to get over our uh, fascination with a building and concentrate more on the Lord and more on what we're trying to do there. And I, I think it's worth making this point too, Dan. I don't think any one of us are advocating that we should ever totally replace uh, kind of the traditional worship with the organ and guitar or whatever and only do an athletic styled worship in the same way that, that we should not give up any athletic worship and only do the traditional um, I, I think we should, we, we can have both. And then that leads us to that whole concept that's in the book in the ninth chapter about having sport church. And we, we give kind of an outline of, in the book, we won't steal a thunder from it, of, of what a liturgy, yes, liturgy might look like by having sports church. And you can share, you've got it. You, you know, of a church it's called basketball church, right? Yeah, yeah, we we had a um, one of our most recent roundtables here in Columbus. We had a, a new group come and join us, and uh, they were explaining how they were a part of this Nazarene church, and um, they 
they decided that after church services are over, so this is Sunday afternoon, that they would start a new program, which became its own church called Basketball Church. And they, they do three different things. One, they play basketball. Two, they share the gospel. And three, they share a meal each and every week. And they are reaching a segment of the city that the church, the more traditional church and worship service is not. And uh, they, they kind of shared it has become church for a lot of these guys. Um, they're far from, from God, many of them. Many of them are being won to Christ. They're seeing people confess Jesus and get baptized. And so, Greg, I think your, your challenge is there. If, if we have both and we see both as worship and other things, uh, we're going to reach more people. And there's great opportunity there. Yeah. And, and you know, even thinking about this idea of where, where we should congregate, you know, it makes me think of um, Jesus's interaction with the Samaritan woman where she said, you know, the Jews tell us we should worship in Jerusalem, but our ancestors have been worshiping on this mountain. And Jesus told her, you know, the true worshipers or the true followers of God will worship in spirit and in truth. And in spirit and in truth, there is no, there's no concrete walls for spirit and truth. It's wherever, you know, people can gather in that. I think a lot of times when we think about when we get hang up on stuff, it's not just that the, not necessarily the location, but also the time. When do we gather? I think a lot of people are like, well, we gather on Sunday at this specific time. And um, so I think just to kind of maybe speak into that, Greg, like, is there, when should we gather to have this time of worship or to have this time of worship, whether it's with the Bible or with a basketball or with both? Well, yes. And there's a couple things that I'll, I'll mention because the timing is important. Um, ask any college student about a uh, eight or nine o'clock a.m. Sunday morning, and they're probably going to say, "Yeah, it's probably not the best time in the world." <coughs> Excuse me, but <laughs> I think you get what I'm saying. And is eleven o'clock time? <coughs> Excuse me, guys, I got something in the throat. Live. Uh, going live here we have problems sometimes <clears throat> so that 11 o'clock but which 11 o'clock are we talking about when auckland new zealand becomes the first part of the world that enters into the new day or um, what about Kathmandu's three quarter of the on the hour anomaly i, I mean I, so that in itself should should signal to us that there's no right necessarily time. Let's keep going on this theme about doing sport church. And even if you don't do the liturgy that the worship part is with a ball, but think about a 6.15 p.m. softball game that's followed by a 7.30 traditional worship. Um, or a 9 a.m. traditional worship followed by a 10.30 a.m. volleyball match. I mean, you can, I think there's ways that we can see how some of this can be uh, incorporated. But there's one thing that I don't want to beat this to death too much here, but I think it, it, it comes back to our perspective and our, our theology about the Lord's Day and the Sabbath day. And God really, from the creation narrative all the way through, um, there's, there's literally hundreds of verses that talk about this. And Old Testament through New Testament, and even the like the first and the last books of the Bible all have this, and it talks about a special day. And I think we're remiss if we just start to go in this direction of saying, well, we can worship any day of the week. Yes, we can. There's no doubt about it. But the day that we give up Sundays, which is now perceived as the Lord's day, 
because it was the day that the Lord was resurrected and the day that the Lord came down in Pentecost. And so those two both occurred on a Lord on, on a Sunday. And the church just said, we got to celebrate this every week. When we get away from that, it's it's amazing how quickly some other things start to fall apart. We we just allow other things to come into our life that are a, have a higher priority. And I, I would just throw a challenge out to whoever's viewing this, listening to this, thinking about this. I give you a ch- I give you a challenge. Just do it for those seven weeks that between resurrection and Pentecost and give the entire day over to the pursuit of the Lord and pursuit of spiritual development and see what happens in your own life, in your own personal life. And I I think that what we do is we say, yeah, I I can go out shopping and yeah, I can go out to eat and yeah, I can go to the, to the, this, that, the other thing, the movie theater, et cetera, et cetera. And, and not only are we making all these other people work and not have an opportunity to go to church, but we're also minimizing our own, our own situation and our own spiritual development. And I, I know that in, in days gone by for most people, still some f- for us today, we'd have three meals. We'd have the morning worship, and then we'd go home and have our family worship, and then we would come back in the evening and have the evening. And like we like we said in a a previous episode of this, who would ever think that if I heard half as many sermons or attended half as many Sunday school classes that I'd be more spiritually mature? And yet that's what we did. We got rid of Sunday evening, and we just had Sunday morning. And then we cut it in half again and went to multiple worship services at the same time having Christian ed. And then people say, I'm just going to go to, I'm just going to go to the worship. I don't have to go to Christian ed anymore. And so again, we're half, uh, you, you see where that's going. And so I, I really think Scott, that you're on to it, that yeah, timing is important. The day of the, the time of the day is not nearly as important. Uh, notwithstanding what I said about it should be, if it's meant to reach young adults, 8 a.m. is probably not the best time. 8 p.m. is probably not the best time for young families. So we, yeah, the time is can be moved around. And the day can be moved around. But let's don't give up on the Lord's Day. I, I, I just think we need to really think that through. I don't know, Scott, did we get to what you were thinking? Yeah, I think so. And and again, like, you know, I kind of talked about how people can get hung up on a lot of times of, you know, when we should gather. I, I don't know where it is in Ohio, but there's like a strip of highway where you drive down and there's a bunch of like church signs. And it's like, no, the true place to worship is on Saturday, not Sunday. And they, they get so hung up on that. And it's like, well, I guess if there's a designated time that we say this is the Lord's Day, whether that's a Sunday or a Saturday, you know, that is also a time that you're saying this is a sacred time for the followers of Jesus to gather, to have this time of communion with him and with one another. Yeah, and, you know, I was privileged and, and quite honored, quite frankly, that the, that our brothers and sisters in the Seventh-day Adventist tradition, uh, they had me come and address their conferences and their churches and whatnot, and and they had heard a lot of the things that I had said about the Lord's Day. And what, what they said to me was, you got everything right except the day. <laughs> and, 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 and we, you know, we shared in, in, a, in a jovial way. But, uh, yeah, I, I, they really do honor Saturday. Mm-hmm. And if, if that's your theological conviction, fine. It's not mine but I understand it. But the principles that are true for that are true for the Lord's day. And that's why they said, you got everything right, except the day. And, and so uh, that's, that's designate a day and, and stick to it is the bottom line of that. And I think this in some ways, 
begs the question then the, these previous things that we've talked about here is then what is the who is this gathering for we call it worship services but this gathering the church who's it for and one of the things that is really missed in, in our churches and this is an under under um lying foundation theological foundation is if we view this worship not for believers but to reach people who are far from jesus then that's going to change a lot of things including maybe the day and the time if we're if if we see the purpose as being that we've got to bring people to jesus here at this gathering then boy we got to change our preaching we got to change our singing we got to change a lot because the people that are that we're trying to help find a relationship with jesus they don't understand any of that uh, and this is facetious but i think you guys understand it i invite somebody to come with me first time they've ever been there and a preacher gets up and says please turn to second timothy or second john and that person's looking at me and saying who who's the first timothy and how, and how do i know how to turn to that person that's just silly for us that have been in the church for decades but that's real for them and so if if it's going to be that then we need to rethink it but i really think that most of this it's what is the worship service for what is the gathering for it is for worship of god it is for equipping the saints discipling them making disciples of them there's the fellowship part that comes along that and there can be evangelism okay but i think it needs to be understood about the general reason that we gather so it's what's the purpose there you guys have thoughts about any of that I think um, a lot of us should be challenged um, in our leads and um, worship service um, and anything related to, to ministry is that there has to be a balance of, of both. Uh, Greg, if we are talking about 2 Timothy, um, also maybe include the page number. Um, you know, if you've got pew Bibles or something like that, of course, you can put the image up on the screen of Scripture. Uh, but I, I think we can do both. Because I think what has happened a lot in our leagues, what has happened a lot in our churches, is we tend to focus on one or the other. Those far from Christ are only those who are believers in Christ. Well, I think if we have a good strategy, we can do both well and recognize ultimately it's about Jesus. And tied to a, a couple of different things there, there is fellowship, there's worship, there should be some form of discipleship, there should be some form of outreach. Um and reaching those who are far from, from Christ. But when we have a clear strategy, how to include as many people as possible and lifting up Christ, making him the object of our worship, I think a lot can still be done there. So I think you offer up a good challenge. I'm almost feeling guys like um, the, the, the last point that we want to make out of this chapter is about who can lead in the church and about leadership. I almost feel like we need to take a whole nother segment to deal with that because there's some obviously some relevant social issues that we need to deal with. But just to wrap this part of it up, from my perspective anyway, is that we know why we need to meet, we know where we can meet and the time we can meet. But then who is the leader of that? Mm -hmm. There's some very specific criteria about that that is in the scripture. This where, when uh, kind of thing. There's a lot more generalities there. There's some overarching principles. But when we get to who's to be the leader, there's some very, very specific biblical mandates that I think we should take some time and ponder. I think so as well. And uh, with that, we are out of time. And like Greg said, we kind of teased how we're going to uh, discuss the final point next week. 
We just want to encourage you to look up Putting the Church in the Game on our website. You can buy it at csrm.org. This chapter, chapter nine, might be a fantastic chapter for you to take church leadership through, for you to take some key volunteers in your sports rec and fitness ministries through as well, as we really identify what the church is all about, who, what, where, when, and why. Um, and so we're going to end this for today. Pick us up next week as we talk about who should be leading. We'll see you then. Take care. The CSRM Podcast. It's a production of CSRM and their production house, Overwhelming Victory. Dr. Greg Lindell is the executive producer, and Scott Stedman is the associate producer and editor. To learn more about CSRM, visit csrm.org. For more information about Overwhelming Victory, visit overwhelmingvictory.org. The CSRM Podcast is the flagship member of the podcast network, Overwhelming Victory Radio. For more information on Overwhelming Victory Radio, or to listen to our partner podcasts, visit overwhelmingvictory.org backslash OV Radio. For CSRM Podcasts, I'm Mike Maloney. Have a blessed day.